certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GLC 38, Section 18, and the Governor March 15, 2020, order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the Sturbridge Conservation Commission will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and general guidelines for remote participation can be found on the town's website. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to listen or to watch the meeting may do so either uh, online via the town's on-demand video broadcast, on cable television, on channel 191, or dial into the meeting at 774-304-1455. Enter 1428 town for the meeting number and 12345 for the access code. This is a phone number that will only be active during the public meetings. No in-person attendance of members of the public may be permitted, but if every effort will be made to ensure that the public is adequately access to the proceedings in real time via technical means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite our best efforts, we will post the town's website an audio or video uh, recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of the proceed proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. The items listed, which may be discussed, are those reasonable anticipated by the chair. I'm not going to go through that. Um, that's an addition. Um, we have a quorum check. Uh, I can see from looking that we have um, full, full attendance. Um, so note that the um, as far as the open meeting for, for public hearings, the, op the opening statement for public hearings, in the interest of saving time, the Sturbridge Conservation Commission will hold all public hearings tonight for work within a wetland, water body, or resource area, or within 200 feet of um, 200 feet buffer zone to the wetland, water body, or resource area in accordance with the Mass Wetland Protection Act, MGL Chapter 131, Section 40, and Associated Regulations, and the Town's Bylaw. Um, and associated regulations. We will not be reading the newspaper ad prior to the opening of the first hearings for each project. The applicant is to submit proof of notification to abutters within 200 feet of the subject property line and proof of legal newspaper advertisement. If these items are not submitted, the public hearing will not open. Additionally, prior to the start of each public hearing, we will announce the location of the project the applicant and the applicant's representative. Um, and that is that. So we go to the meeting. Um, Becky, do you want to start off? We've got some time before the 615 session. So sure. Yep. Go ahead. Um, so we can go down the agenda after the public hearings and go to the wetland decisions. Uh, we do have a couple of requests for certificates of compliance on here. Okay. Uh, one is for yep. Yeah, uh, one is for 116 Bookfield Road, DEP file number 300-729. Uh, the current requester is Gary Kalonic. Um, uh, they're requesting the issuance of the certificate of compliance. Um, what they're asking for is a partial certificate. Let me get to my notes here. Uh, so the work covered under the order. Uh, was for the subdivision of one lot into two on one of the properties uh, there was an existing single family house already on there so that single family house is now 116 Brookfield Road and which is the subject property of this request the only work on this portion of the property uh, 116 Brookfield Road included the removal of a garage um, the lot is only partially located within the 200-foot buffer zone. The majority of the work for the new single-family house, which is now lot 120, was within, mostly within jurisdiction. Uh, and that's what the primary um, or the majority of the permit covers that work. Uh, I did go out and do a site visit today. 
um, this property location um, within the past year had a fire at the property about it was the treetops Mont Montessori school um, so the building is no longer there the foundations there hard top still in place um, as it was being used as a, a daycare center um, based off of the fact that the the permit was primarily for the development of the, the new lot that was subdivided off of here and the only work on this property within jurisdiction was the removal of that garage uh, which doesn't look like it was relocated i don't have any concerns and i'd recommend issuing a partial for it for 116 brookfield road the remainder the work on the 120 um someone would still have to request the release of the order off of that piece okay <clears throat> anybody david you want to start off any, uh, we have two daughters that worked at 116 Brookfield Road. I know that that building is no longer there, so our CFC is absolutely in order. All right. Anybody else like to speak on the matter? No. no? Seeing none, I don't have any comments. Becky, um, all in favor? Start with you, Mark, Stephen. No. Stephen Chittister in favor of the partial uh, certificate of compliance. Eric? Eric Gaspar in favor. Steve Haldeman? Steve Haldeman in favor. David? David Barnacle in favor. And Ed Goodwin in favor. Thank you. Uh, All right, next okay. request for certificate of compliance is for 24 Cedar Lake Drive. Uh, DEP file number 300-285. Um, so that's an old one here. Um, the, the project summary was uh, the work was, um, it was just for the expansion of a lawn on a developed non-conforming single family house lot on Cedar Lake. Um, that was the only thing. There's kind of a sketch plan in there that I found that showed that work. I did do a site visit and go out there and take a look. Um, it appears to be consistent with that site plan, so I don't have any concerns Concerns with that. I recommend um, issuing a complete certificate of compliance for that project. All right. Any input from the board? Seeing none, um, how do you vote, Eric? Uh, Eric Gaspar, in favor to approve the uh, certificate of compliance. Steven? Steve Haldeman, this is. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let me try that again. Uh, Steve? Uh, the old Steve, uh, I approve. Okay, the young Steve? Steven should have to uh, approve. David? David Barnacles approved. <laughs> and Ed Goodwin approved. <laughs> All right, Becky, we got two. We got a two for <laughs> Main Street. All right. Yep, um, 501 Main Street. This is a draft orders of conditions. This is a project, um, well, it's DP file number 300 1084. This project was approved at the last meeting. I did draft um, orders of conditions for your review. Um, looking for approval of that so we can issue that permit. Okay. So, do we have a motion to close the public hearing? Well, it's not, yeah, no, it's not a public hearing. No. It's, not, it's not a public hearing. I thought we continued it. No, you guys closed that. Oh, did we close it? Close it two weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, all right, so we closed it. So yeah. we. That was the parking so lot. So we closed it without a file number? No, if I had a file number. You're thinking of 53 um, Wells Park Road, the trail one. That one we continued. That did not have a file number. Okay. This all one right. had a file number. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're just just approving this with the order of conditions? Yeah, any questions? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, going around the board, um, Eric? Uh, no comments. They look good to me. David? No yeah. comment. David Barnacle. 
Uh, Stephen? I'm good. And Steve? Uh, yeah, I'm good with it. I was uh, really impressed with that, uh, Betsy. That was a very detailed order of conditions. Very impressed. Thank you. Thanks. All right. And I have no comment. <laughs> so, put to a vote. Um, do I have a motion? Uh, Steve Haldeman, I move we approve the order of conditions for 501 Main Street. Uh, so David, you again? Like a barnacle. David seconds it. Um, all right. Any discussion? All in favor? Eric? Eric Gaspar in favor? Steve Haldeman? Steve Haldeman in favor? Stephen Judester and his friend. Stephen Judester, I approve. Ed Goodwin, I approve. I think did I get did I get you, Eric? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I approve. Oh, sorry, David. You know, I was confused. I knew there was somebody hiding there that. I you get distracted by his friend. I know. The tail. The fan of the tail. Yeah. Uh, all right, we are now to 612. Becky, what else have you got? Um, we can do the approval of the minutes of the if you'd like. All right, that's good. I, yep, I, I did have a request. So I did um, revise the minutes, which I sent back out to you, but I did have another request to add some discussion underneath the... Um, Matthew T. Question okay. of that. Um, so I just drafted something real quick. If you want, I can read it to you. Summarizing that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I just added uh, Matthew T has started the project this fall, but the remainder of the project is on hold until the spring. Um, RG was on site recently during heavy rain, and the erosion controls had given away. DOT was notified and repairs have been made. In addition, the Western Cave Trail had overflowed and flooded a residence. The DOT and BSD group staff were on site to review and will be coming up with a plan to look at the remainder of the trail to make repairs, etc. DOT will stay in better communication on the project and will provide an update in the beginning of January. All right, great, Becky. Exactly what I was looking yeah. for when I asked the question. Okay. So, do we, we have, have a motion? Minutes. Do we have a second? Yes, modified. Eric, yes, one second. Eric, second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Uh, Eric. Eric Gaspar in favor. David. David Bernicke in favor. Stephen. Stephen Schuster in favor. Steve. Steve Alderman in favor. And Ed in favor. That's the newly shorn Steve Alderman. <laughs> I did that myself. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you make the old Thank you. <laughs> right. like a um, we are at 614, Becky. All right, we're going to go to the public hearing. Because of this, a new agenda. This new agenda looks beautiful, Becky. I like it. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank, thank Aaron, too. So, thank a you, while Aaron. Back, Holly and I had, Holly and I had you, gone Aaron. to a, um, a workshop um, that uh, Agent Newton had put on about running an efficient conservation office. And there was a bunch of materials in a presentation we had, and Aaron was kind of going through stuff and came across this. And um, so, kind of put it together to use it and set it up and part of our way of kind of doing the notes, like I was saying, and the, the meeting minutes kind of moving forward. So glad you guys like it. And thank you, Aaron. Good. Yeah. All right. With, with that said, we are at um, 6.15. So we'll go to, um, hold on a second here, 30 Main Street. And 20 Fisk Hill Road, notice of intent. 
uh, development of residential and commercial cul-de-sac um, subdivision, DEP file number 300-1086. Uh, uh, owner applicant is Matt Sosick. Um, request to review the order of conditions. Representative is Peter Engel of McClure Engineering. Peter, are you here? I am. Okay, great. Um, Becky, you want to start off? Sure. Actually, well, okay. Pete, do you want to? Well, actually, do you want to give the to go first? Yeah, yeah. Let them give their summary of the project for you. Sounds good. All right. Um, so basically, a proposed subdivision roadway at the entrance of Twin Main Street. Uh, the property also has frontage. Uh, or 30 Main Street, excuse me. Property also has frontage at 20 Fisco Road, but that frontage won't be uh, disturbed at all. Um, basically, the subdivision would come off of Main Street. Um, there are wetlands, <coughs> numerous wetlands on the property. Um, all the proposed subdivision road work would be remaining outside the 25 foot no disturb. Um, the roadway itself is outside of the 50 foot snow build. Um, I believe the entire project is within buffer zone, uh, within the 200 foot buffer zone. Um, we do have one stormwater basin for the roadway located adjacent to Main Street um, and the new roadway intersection. Uh, the stormwater basin and the stormwater management is designed to meet all of the DEP stormwater regulations. Um, at this point in time, <clears throat> there's only five proposed lots. Uh, the roadway is proposed a little over a thousand feet long. Um, this is zone change in that area. And the main purpose of the subdivision is to create two lots within that residential zone. Um, for the purpose of a senior housing housing community. Um, the rest of the subdivision is within a commercial zone. Um, at this point, for those lots are kind of preliminary and up in the air, um, other than that senior housing community. Um, so that's kind of the main, main um, purpose of the subdivision. Um, there are a couple areas on site in the vicinity of that subdivision, which have been previously altered, there was logging on site. Um, areas close to the wetlands that were altered at one point in time. Uh, part of this proposal would be to um, kind of move there, take those areas, um, and almost fix what was done before while creating this, this new roadway that would be outside of any of those 50 foot no build lines. All right, so, so uh, jurisdiction for this project, um, it's a buffer zone only uh, for impact. There's no direct resource area impact. Uh, what we're looking at for resource areas here. Um, and I apologize, my notes didn't include everything. We have uh, bordering vegetative wetlands. We also have an iso isolated land subject to flooding. And there is bank um, associated with an intermittent stream within one of the bordering vegetative wetlands. Um, just to add for the project summary, um, you know, as Pete said, this project is for the construction of the um, cul de sac roadway and associated um, stormwater and infrastructure. Uh, the project does not include. Um, any of the development for these lots, uh, that will come further with separate um, permitting and review. Uh, so for this, it looks like the construction will disturb approximately three acres of existing woodland. Um, stormwater management system includes um, catch stations, manholes, a subsurface pipe network, and a single stormwater basin. The base basin is proposed as infiltration basin. Stormwater from the lower portion of the road will be directed within 25 feet of a wetland. This discharge um, is shown as 
having pretreatment, however, it's the recharge proposed for that one. Um, as Pete indicated, there is uh, restoration planting areas within 25 and 50 feet of the buffer zone. Um, some of that is for the forestry activities and some for um, side slopes, things like that associated uh, limited work with the basin construction. Uh, the, some of the shrubs uh, species that are proposed for those restoration plantings include chokeberry, viburnum, blueberry, winterberry, and elderberry. Um, I did reach out to DCR about the forest cutting plan. I'm just waiting to hear back from them. They'll be in the office tomorrow. Just wait, uh, reach out to see if that forest cutting plan um, was closed out by them at this point. So I'll have an answer for you soon on that. Um, DEP did issue a file number for this project. Uh, the only comment that was included at this time was that they asked if anticipated uses future development of the subdivision lot will result in the crossing of thresholds uh, established for the filing of an EIR or ENF with NEPA. Um, so that was their one comment on there. Uh, the project is subject to the town of Sturbridge stormwater bylaw and the MAP DEP stormwater standards. Uh, the project has been filed with the planning board, it will require a variance for the roadway length and width. Uh, the planning department has already begun to review and has contracted um, Power Corporation for a peer review for um, compliance with the um, local stormwater bylaw and the state stormwater standards. Um, at this time, I would recommend um, that we look for a um, peer review for compliance with the you know, stormwater regulation state and local from a um, professional engineer, and also a peer review for uh, wetland delineation from a professional wetland scientist. Um, the delineation should include review of the on-site wetlands, um, obviously for the flagging, but also for vernal pool habitat, and be inclusive of all areas within 200 feet of the proposed work. So this is a, a bigger project site. Um, in, just to know in the future when we get to the point of initiative for an order of conditions, I recommend that the limited wetland review should be noted in the permit and that any future potential applicants will be required to survey for wetlands um, on the remainder of the property that might be outside of the, the scope of this phase one. So also, um, since the planning department has already started a peer review for um, stormwater compliance, it recommends that um, look at review and approval of the PAR proposal and that we do a joint review with them since they've already started that. We have used them in the past. And then um, this project site did have um, a project proposed on it before. It was the EP file number 300-776. Um, Permit has long expired and the work wasn't initiated. Um, at that time, a peer, um, um, R. Allen, did work for the commission on that site. Um, due to the age of that, I recommend having everything looked at again, especially with the forest cutting plan that was done out there. But um, I'd recommend the board considering um, listing a quote from a quote from Ecotech as they they're familiar with the site and have been on there before. That's all. Okay. Going through um, board members first, uh, Eric. With regards to the Ecotech suggestion by uh, Becky, would uh, the applicant have an issue with with that? Uh, nope. All right. That's all I had. Mr. Barnacle. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, you indicated that the roadway would be um, outside of the 25 foot, probably within the 50 foot. However, the roadway is actually constructed. That probably indicates that with sloping, it would take up a portion of the distance between the 50 foot and the 25 foot both of which are no touch zone. How can we justify that? Right, so the road is completely outside the 50 foot. Uh, there is minimal grading for the road itself within that 50 foot. 
uh, the stormwater management basin is within that 50 foot. Um, we are proposing some, some restoration work and plantings within that area, um, as well as, you know, previously disturbed areas. But um, the roadway, <clears throat> all the pavement and everything is, is located outside of that 50 foot. I'm not concerned about the pavement because I recognize that'll be outside the 50 foot. But how about leading up to the pavement? Even we're not just going to be laid, you're going to have to do some foundation work first. Uh, the, the majority of the grading issue, that you have C2. I can pull the other plan. What, what page do you want? C2 is good, uh, what you have. Okay. So, so you can there's only really three areas where grading inside that 50 foot buffer would be. Um, there's a tiny, tiny sliver um, around station 500, which is more of in the middle of the road, tiny sliver, maybe 20 square feet. The other area would be right at the beginning of the roadway. You're coming into the site on the roadway from Main Street on the left hand side. That grading extends into the 50 foot buffer, um, maybe 10 feet or so. Um, that area is actually already cleared from the existing logging path that was created through there. Um, and then the only other area within that 50 foot buffer that would be cleared and graded uh, would be for the stormwater basin. Um, all that area, any, any grading. We're proposing, we're proposing to stabilize with uh, erosion control blankets, uh, core matting, um, conservation seed mix, loam, um, and then the plantings of you know, shrub shrubberies um, and basically rehabbing that, that area within the 50 foot buffer that, that would be disturbing. So the basin then would be between the 50 foot and the 25 foot? The edge of the basin is at the 50 foot buffer. There is some grading from the 50 foot to the 25 foot buffer for that basin. The basin itself is, is technically outside the 50 foot buffer. Mr. Chairman. All right, um, Stephen, it us. Yeah, so, um, and just trying to understand how you're proposing to eventually develop this project, it, it looks to me like you've got some very steep grades at the end of the cul-de-sac um, and to the east of the, of the roadway coming in. So is the intention um, that you will just be developing lots along the, the west side of the road and perhaps one at the end um, on the east side of the road? Right, so we have technically five lots. Um, there would be one on the right side just beyond the basin, which is a very small and likely not a, likely not a, it's a, it technically considered a buildable lot by zoning standards, but, um, it's kind of a tough lot to develop. Uh, lot two goes in the back of that B series wetland. Um, there's a lot of property behind that wetland. Um, the access drive would come from the subdivision roadway, basically hugging the property line and the zone line um, within the 100 foot buffer of that wetland into that upland area. Uh, similar with lot three, um, a roadway would have to, or a driver would have to come off the roadway, hug the property line and the zone line to get up into that um, large property. Um, lot five, like you said, is is pretty flat and level with the road. Um, and then lot four is at the end of the cul-de-sac. Again, that's another residential lot. 
um, what the future use is. It could be a single family home. It could be an assisted living facility. Um, that's kind of up in the air, but obviously there'd be some grading necessary for that driveway as that property continues to go uphill. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the grade on that. It just seems like that would be difficult to take a access road off of the cul-de-sac. So. Um, I, I guess that's it for me. Yeah, the grade I'm showing here is strictly what's necessary for this subdivision road and nothing further at this time. All right, Steve, Steve Alderman. Yeah, uh, there's uh, so many lots uh, that you're uh, that are on this property or on this plan. Uh, are those really going to just be a single family home up there, or is there room to uh, expand and have multiple houses, uh, another cul-de-sac uh, up there? Uh, I, I see that as a as a possibility. The other thing that I'm concerned about is that part of this is commercial, and uh, and there's a lot of wetland uh, in the, in those areas. I guess I'll cut to the chase. I hate to see phased projects with a lot of wetlands, and you're putting in a road and. Uh, is this going to be a, a self-imposed hardship down the road when you come in and uh, down the road, sorry, uh, in the future where you say, hey, we've already built the road, you approved it, now we want to build such and such, and yeah, we're going to have to fill in some wetlands and so on. Uh, I'm concerned. Here we've got the classic crazed approach with a lot of space. We've got commercial, we've got wetlands, and we've got some... Uh, fairly large properties with wetlands in them that we have no idea what's going to be developed in those in the future. I'm, I'm surprised that DEP did not make a comment about, but they sort of did when they talked about passing thresholds, but uh, they don't like phased uh, uh, projects either. Right. Um, to speak to that, I mean, it's phased in that this roadway has to be created in order to create frontage in order to have these multiple lots in order to have a residential zoned lot um like i said the main purpose of the road is to create basically lot lot three which would be a, a senior housing community um the other four lots are kind of up in the air of what they could be or would be um the main the main purpose is for a 55 plus senior housing community on lot three, which is over 40 acres of land. Um, we can't submit plans on that senior housing community until there's a legal lot for that property to be developed on. Um, so unfortunately it is somewhat phased, but legally it has to be phased that the, the town Planning department would not take a site plan for a project that wouldn't legally be allowed. Um, to touch on the NEPA thing, as far as I know, um, you know, we're not going to touch any of those thresholds. Um, they're, you know, the the ENS thresholds themselves are pretty high. We did a traffic study on. Uh, five preliminary uses, including that uh, senior housing community development, um, the traffic study, the total parking, the sewage flow, the water, the land disturbance, none of it touches any of those MEPA thresholds. Now, does that mean it, it never will? I mean, there's possibilities for these lots that, you know, could be somewhere not where we're looking or what the current owner is looking at right now, but um, I can't really speak to that. At this point in time, the the potential uses would not meet those meet the thresholds. And like I said, the, the main purpose is to create that lot three in the back for a senior housing development. Well, I was on the planning board for 
I don't know, seven years or so. And we, from time to time, had people come in and say, look, this is just an informational thing. And I just, here's a, we don't have the rule, we don't have legal lots, but we're going to try this in the future. But in the meantime, we're thinking about such and such on this, if this becomes a lot. I mean, they have a parcel or a lot, whatever, a legal lot. Right now, it's not. And this is not official. This is just a uh, heads up, friendly, unofficial visit about your opinion, your thoughts on what we might do in the future. So, yep. And as you know, we, we had multiple, multiple meetings with Gene Bubon on that very thing. Um, that's the reason that this is moving forward and not, you know, getting canceled. So. We might indicate that we won't go probably not be able to do anything about them right now. So those are my thoughts, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, who is anybody else to speak besides me? After you're done, I'd like to say a couple of words, Ed, please. Okay, yeah. Uh, my my questions are pretty simple. Why did we just get this change today? What was the change? Uh, and, you know, and you know, so the package says that it was uh, completed on 11 11 in 20. Now we're in, we're at uh, 1 5 21, which is when you, when you gave us an update. Right. So, um, in meeting with Gene, um, it was, we originally were proposing the stormwater basin to be on an easement. Uh, the town subdivision regulations do not allow for that, so it had to be on its own lot. Um, because of that, originally lot one and the stormwater basin were basically mirrored. Um, so we flipped that in order to save lot one while also putting the stormwater basin on its own lot, which has to be deeded to the town in the event that this is approved and constructed. Um, you know, I, I, I know we have a meeting today, and you probably didn't have the time to review that, which was assumed that, you know, a, a peer review would be getting voted on, um, and we weren't going to be proceeding with a, with a vote tonight regardless. Right. Um, as far as sewer and water is concerned, what can you say about that? Right. Uh, water is not a problem. Uh, there's adequate pressure out in Main Street to supply the entire line um, to meet hydrant uh, fire flows at the end of the cul-de-sac. Um, the only lot that could potentially really have issues down the road, potentially on what it's going to be if it is a senior housing development, um, is lot three. There's a lot of elevation change in the very far part of that lot. Um, so they would likely need their own private water booster station um, as part of that development. Uh, sewer is another story. Um, I believe the applicant, as well as Gene, um, DPW, um, and uh, Mr. Bridges is, are, are trying to figure out what the deal is with the sewer at this point. There was a 20,000 gallon per day allotment approved for this property back in 2007. Whether that is still good or not remains to be known uh, as far as I know. Um, I thought it was going to, at that point in time, I thought it was going to Southbridge. So the sewer in Main Street does go to Southbridge. Um, okay. All right, now, so that would be the same. Okay. Right. Um, the issue is that the town is somewhat is close to their sewage limit with the town of Southbridge. Um, the owner does also have an agreement with the town of Southbridge that he acquired in 2007 um, to send flows to Southbridge um, not, without a limit. I'm not sure how that plays into everything. Um, and I do know, you know, obviously it wouldn't be any time in the near future that the town is is hoping to 
get a pump station at some point in time down here to basically capture all this flow going to Southbridge and get it back to the storage treatment plant since there's capacity for that now when there wasn't back when that Southbridge agreement was put in place. All right. Um, to say there's, there's still some work to do on the sewer as far as uh, yeah, um, this goes. Becky, I guess we're, we're at 640. This is supposed to go to 625. Um, we were given a uh, okay. short, short, short amount of time on, on reviewing the plan. And if two more short ones for you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. First short one is, can you explain why, if you indicate that lot one will be very difficult for you guys to be able to work, why are you going to continue working it? Uh, my answer to that would be that the current property owner wants the possibility of selling a lot. Okay. And number two is just a reminder for everybody, if you go down Hall Road starting off of Route 20, on the left-hand side, there is a road that goes up to a cul-de-sac, up a hill. Originally, that was going to be for a nursing home over in the woods and homes along the side of the cul-de-sac. It was built. Nothing else was. It's still sitting there. And this has got to be 15 years now. I believe, Mr. Halterman, you might have even been on the commission or on the planning board when that took place. I was. So we don't need to have X number of cul-de-sacs that are simply cul-de-sacs for the sake of having cul-de-sacs, so we need to be careful. Um, was there any other comments? I mean, yeah, I, have, I, have a real, oh, I have a real quick comment, if I may. Uh, in 2007, they were going to run a pipe to the west, to the uh, Southbridge treatment plant, not using the main on uh, on Main Street, and uh, and I can remember that was a concern of the board of selectmen because now they've got uh, a piece of property in uh, Sturbridge that is using uh, Southbridge's uh, uh, wastewater allotment, and what would happen if they there was a problem with Southbridge, so they had their own connection. Uh, and, and it's odd that you're going to run uh, the water is for that uh, senior citizen thing, but yet uh, it, it doesn't uh, satisfy the needs for that. So it's just kind of odd that you're going to have to put a, a well in anyway. Just a thought. And, um, um, not a concern, just odd. Well, I, would, I'm, I would like to, at this point, continue this meeting. Uh, Becky, if you could work on um, the issues we have as far as getting pr uh, prior review um, set up, what that's going to cost, what we're looking at, and if the meeting we can, as members, we can take further look at this. Maybe we can do a site visit. Uh, depending on the weather, and um, look at some flags, see what we're what we're actually looking at um, between now and the next meeting. So, so just to clarify, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. This is Stephen. I, I just wanted to make one additional request to. Um, I, I would. I'm, I'm very hesitant to approve something like this when we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. You know, it is a phased project and we're getting statements saying that, you know, they're not going to be anywhere near the NEPA thresholds for all the things that they're planning. And I don't, I, I, I don't personally want to take that on faith. So, you know, I would like to see, I'd like to see some conceptual plans and some actual numbers put to that of what, you know, the amount of land disturbance, the amount of impervious surface, you know, the whole nine yards for this entire, you know, plan development or, or whatever is, 
you know, they think is going to happen. That's just my request. Okay. That, um, Perry, uh, I'm sure that there's stuff that has been fleshed out on this. It could be brought to us. Am I wrong? Uh, for lot three, uh, the rest of those we, we don't have any conceptual plans for at this time. Just the 55 plus. Just the 55 plus. Yeah, lot three. Okay. All right. I'm, I think sorry, we need to. I I know you got to move on, but you know. You said, you know, I raised the point. First of all, thank you, Steve, uh, for uh, for uh, following up with my thoughts about the future of this project. Uh, there's just too many questions here of what. Anyway, so I said you could have an informal meeting and talk about the whole project. And you said, oh, yeah, we've been having a lot of meetings with Gene uh, to that purpose. So show us something. And uh, or, or you didn't have uh, meetings with Gene. Uh, about it. I mean, anyway, you're saying two different things. I'm not getting a warm, fuzzy feeling. The, um, we have, this is the plan we have before us. Um, we have to work within this as far as the wetlands are concerned and make a decision on that, on what we have. If, if they don't have anything further, um, they don't have anything further. They're not bringing us anything else. They're asking us to approve this. Um, if you don't have a warm, fuzzy feeling, you don't have a warm, fuzzy feeling. That, um, but we want to move forward. We, we have, I'd like to get a continuation, um, and we can, you know, I would like to take a site visit. The flags are all there, so the flags are there, right, Peter? The wall flag. Yep. So we get we can get a real uh, look at uh, what we're dealing with on the call, on on the land and and get a chance to go through the plan. I just got these plans today, um, and I and it's not like I didn't have anything else to do today. So um, I'd like to take some time and look at them. Um, and include a site visit. Anybody want to make a motion to that effect, or is you, you're all quiet? What would the, what would the motion? Would you say, David? What would the representative like in terms of the continuation, if you would like the continuation? Uh, Do we want to answer that? Sure. Uh, I mean, we'd, we'd be happy with the continuation of the next hearing, um, expecting, you know, a site walk and a peer review for wetlands. Uh, and we know planning board is doing a peer review for stormwater. So, um, you know, we'd be happy to continue in order to meet all these requirements. Week sufficient, Steve? What was that question to? Did you leave all the Peter? Uh, I believe so. If we don't have anything back by then, then we can continue through the next meeting. And I'm in favor of a continuation two weeks. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just before you, you move forward, um, two things. One, um, this is a public hearing, so we can post a comment. And then oh, yeah. second, um, yeah. Thank you. I could just request that. Yes, but you clarify what you're um, requiring here. I, I recommended, I mean, obviously, we, under, you know, our regulations, we need to look at the stormwater. Um, the planning has already started a peer review. I recommend, you know, that we do a peer review, a joint peer review with them, and then also, you know, vote for the um, peer review from the professional wetland scientists, as I outlined earlier. Uh, it's like the recommendation is, um, getting the proposal from Ecotech because they have been on the site and done that before. Okay, so, you, but we want to get the information together, right? You're not going to hire. You're not going to hire them. 
Correct. I would get that information and bring, bring it back to you. Bring it, bring it back. Okay. Yeah. And that would satisfy David. I mean, we should have an agreement um, that we want to use Ecotech again. Make sure that the applicant is okay with that. Well, yeah. So what would I yeah. yeah, and what I'd recommend is that I would I would get that um, proposal from that, provide them that to, to both the board and the applicant to, to look at since we're just getting the one at this time. Right. And we would have to vote on it at the next meeting, David. So when it, whenever it was available. And the continuation, Steve, do I have a motion to continue? Wait a minute, yeah, before I do that. No, no, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm messing up again here. Uh, Jeff, could we see if there's anybody in the audience who'd like to speak to this? Thank you. Well, Bob, just checking on that. We, so we actually, we have quite a few uh, actions that have to take place before we actually are ready to uh, approve or disapprove of this road. And, and, and I agree with you at the, uh, what is before us is the road, and I've uh, and, and you know, and I'll look at this. Uh, we will look at this as uh, just as the road with the peer reviews that are uh, that are upcoming. So whether or not uh, the, the wetlands bylaws and so on can be done in two weeks, uh, I don't know because we still have to vote on hiring somebody. So this might be more than but just it's not going to be done in two weeks, but we. we Steve, it's not going to be done in two weeks. Uh, very good. I didn't think it would be. Yeah, no. Um, we, we're going to, you know, approve peer review at the next meeting. Uh, very good. I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. Jeff, any luck? I was waiting for an opportunity to ask. So if, if <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Who, who would have not? Good evening. Is there anyone on the public line that would like to speak to the 30 Main Street Tony Fiskill Road public hearing? Hello, is there anyone on the line that would like to speak to the 30 Main Street Tony Fiskill Road public hearing? There's no one on the line. Thanks, Jeff. All right, so a motion was made, but I don't think seconded to continue. David, did you make a motion to continue the yep. public hearing? I did. And Eric, did I hear you say seconded? I, I absolutely did. Eric Aspar seconded. Okay. okay. Um, all those in favor? Uh, well, before that, before that, you have a comment. Discussion? Yep, go ahead. One article of discussion is, in reference to Mr. Halterman's comments a couple of minutes ago, remember that for the last 25 or 30 years of the Conservation Commission, we have been uh, moderately opposed to phased projects. And each time that we hear about a phased project, boots bumps ride. I hope that that is not being left behind as a, a principle of the Conservation Commission. You know that that would take a, a vote, but if you're asking me, David, you know I'm thoroughly familiar with getting burned by phase projects as a, as an individual on the board. So, but the, but the project is being brought as a road, well, and this is what we have to We can we can vote on the motion. Yeah. That's just a comment. Okay. To no, that's fine. It's within any other comments before we vote. I guess I would just say that, that without the 25 years of, this is Eric, by the way, without the 25 years of experience that um, I would hope that we can look at projects and put proper language surrounding them to make sure that if we have concerns about uh, projects creating their own hardships or encumbrances, that we can make the applicants aware that those types of things uh, uh, are, are not going to be 
uh, wavered on and still allow them to move forward with uh, the projects in there, in there because I think especially in this economic environment, expecting a, a full fleshed out plan for multiple lots is, is probably unlikely. Um, so in fairness to the applicant um, and in just my own personal opinion, um, I, I, uh, I don't know that we should stop just because we're talking five, six lots and we only have one lot that is conceptually designed at this point. So that's my only comment, and I'll, I'll, I'll yield. Any other chairman before we vote? Yeah, uh, as a uh, deputy director of the Department of Environmental Protection, I had the liberty to tell applicants with phase projects that uh, they go back to the drawing board and bring me a whole project. So can be done. Like I say, I was wondering why the, EPA, the DEP was uh, not making a comment about that. But enough said, you know, we beat that horse to death. Anybody else? All right. Yeah, uh, in favor of a continuation. Did somebody say something? Becky, yes, Becky. Becky. Yeah, I, yeah. Becky. So I just, um, if you want to discuss and vote on um, the Park Corporation proposal that um, Planning Department has solicited, um, so we can do that joint peer review with them. That was provided to take a look at. So just get that moving forward okay. too. Becky, this, Becky, this plan was dropped off today, no, no. Um, and, and I'm and I'm at 6:56 now with people waiting. Um, I think that can be continued. Right. I mean, we have had this application, the plan set. They did make a revision to the, the lot line, which right we got late last week, and, and we got the hard copy of it today. So I mean, that's that's fine if that's what you you want to do. Yeah, I'd like to just continue this because we were supposed okay. to be done by the 625. All in favor of a continuation? David? David Barnack, in favor. Eric? Eric Gaspar, in favor. Steve Haldeman? Steve Haldeman, I'm in favor. Stephen Chidester? Stephen Chidester, in favor. And Ed Goodwin, in favor. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. See you in two weeks. Yep. Yes, the continuation right is, is January 19th, and that would be at 6.05. Sorry, 6.10. 6.15, sorry. My mind's messed up here. All right, we're now at 6.25. We have 53 Wells Park Road, continued notice of intent, trail improvement project, DEP file number 300 dash. 1085. So uh, this is a continuation from our last. Meeting. Yep, Tom yep. is on here. Uh, I'll just give a quick summary. Uh, this was a continuation from the last meeting. Uh, we did go over the project. Just as a reminder, at that time we were waiting on a DEP file number of comments, which we had not received. Uh, we did receive those uh, since that last meeting. File number is 300 1085. DEP did not have any comments on the project. Uh, what was discussed last time was um, a couple uh, things for the project. The commission had requested that the Bog Bridge decking be elevated to seven and a half inches versus the six, and that no motorized vehicle signs were posted along the trail. Um, since that time, I did um, draft the uh, order of the conditions and provided to you the provided those to you for uh, review prior to this meeting. Sure. I did include those two special conditions. So uh, the project would have our, our typical um, special conditions and then the following two conditions for the bog bridge and the no motorized vehicle sign. Um, my recommendation at this time, um, after if the applicant has anything else to add, would be to vote to close the hearing and issue um, the order of conditions as drafted. Great. I'll start with you, Tom. Do you have any uh, anything additional to add? Uh, no, we have uh, no problems with your your uh, requirements. Has this gone before the uh, to vote before the uh, federation or whatever you call yourselves? No, the association will have a meeting in May, 
And so uh, um, I'm just trying to get together quotes and uh, and your approval for the project before before okay. May, so something to vote on. Okay. All right. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve file number 800 dash. We need to close the public hearing first. Close the public hearing. Yeah. Oh. I'll comment too. Go ahead, Dave. Comment. Yeah. Um, Jeff. You ready? You ready for it? Yeah, we're ready. Okay. Yep. Good evening. Is there any public comment on the application for 53 Wells Park Road trail improvement project? Good evening. Is there any public comment for 53 Wells Park Road? There's no one to comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Eric so Gaspar, moved. Uh, uh, Eric Gaspar, second. <laughs> All right, Steve Alderman, Eric Gaspar. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Steve Alderman? Steve Alderman, in favor. Eric? Eric Gaspar, in favor. David? David Burnicle, in favor. Stephen? Stephen Chibister in favor. And Ed Goodwin in favor. All right, David, All right. do your thing. I make a motion to approve of DEP file number N85 with the addition of the um, extra order of conditions as indicated by the agent. Do I have a second? Our second. Discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Uh, Steve Haldeman, how do you vote? Steve Haldeman in favor. Steve Tedesta. Steven Chittister in favor. David Barnacle. David Barnacle in favor. Eric. Eric Gaspar in favor. And Ed Gitter in favor. All right. Yeah, I have flipped off. So, Becky, where are we? Want to go to old business or? Sure. Becky? Yeah, we have old business yeah. items, we have new business, and we have administrative updates. So, it's your choice. You're, like you're, you're calling it the new schedule. Yeah, let's do the new schedule before it gets closed out. All right. <laughs> All right, so. I'm going to share my screen. I gave you this um, in advance to look at. So at uh, the last meeting, yep. last couple of meetings, we've been talking about this year's schedule. Um, we gave you some options for the last meeting um, to look at. One of the things that was brought up was looking at um, Wednesdays and maybe doing an every three week schedule on Wednesdays. Well, we looked at that, and unfortunately, because of other boards meeting, it just wouldn't work out where we could alternate doing that every three weeks and not fall a couple days or so on days that were there meeting. So we kind of scratched that idea and what we presented to you for now, um, there's just no other days right now that a every three week schedule would work and kind of seems like some people were more interested in staying within every two week schedule for now. So what we presented here is looking at um, just staying with our current um, every two weeks, first and third Tuesday of the month, um, and also looking at an every two week schedule on Wednesday. Now, the only reason I looked at an every two week Wednesday schedule was because there's four dates here that um, the Board of Selectmen rescheduled their meeting to that um, we would need to reschedule to. I guess my recommendation at this time is I'd rather just stay with the Tuesday schedules we have versus going to another day unless it was to a three-week schedule. Um, if you look at this, um, we gave you some possible options for rescheduling days um, for those meetings that we have to reschedule or cancel. Now, for if you look at the first yellow one, which is Tuesday, February 16th, 
Uh, we can't move it to the following day, which is a Wednesday, because UBA meets. We'd have to do it on that Thursday um, or cancel it. We could reschedule to July 7th. Um, looking at this, this, this does not account for your summer schedule. So this, this, this shows two meetings in July, August, and September. Obviously, there's two that are crossed out here because of needing to reschedule. So you can either reschedule them or um, look to canceling them. So I don't know if anyone has any comments um, or any other suggestions. So, Becky, just to be clear, the ones that you have highlighted and crossed out, we can't meet on those dates? Is that Correct. There's a uh, board of selectmen meet on the Monday before us, and there's holidays, so they rescheduled their meeting to Tuesday already. And because we're doing these virtually, and they need to broadcast and the software, um, we just can't really do both at the same time. Right. So we're getting big, okay. big times by the board of selectmen. I don't, I don't think we stand for this. I, th I think we go <laughs> out of taking our day. No, they can move to Wednesday. <laughs> They could skip a meeting. What do they do? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, the, you know, the only thing that I noted on there was, I, I, you know, I don't know that. I know that there was some discussion about having meetings uh, twice during the summer as well, which, you know, I don't, I don't know whether or not that logically that makes sense or doesn't make sense, but... Uh, we've we've now gone from a scenario where we're talking about every three weeks and cutting that down to 18 meetings, and I have 24 meetings in front of us when we would normally have 21 plus site visits associated with that. Uh, so uh, we've uh, in this schedule increased our uh, our meeting obligations by uh, six meetings uh, net net, including site visits. So. I would not be in favor of this schedule as laid out, uh, just just because I, I don't see that uh, that there's a need for us to increase the number of meetings. So do you mean just going back to like the summer schedule and taking out those extra meetings? Yeah, whether it's the summer or it's strategically, there's other parts of the year where we feel like it's you know unnecessary, uh, unnecessary but it is. You know, it's not just one meeting. It's one meeting and a day of site visits. So it ends up being two meetings for every one we add. So in this in this situation, we have added six weeks of obli or six days of obligation. Well, what she's actually put here is the schedule that we've been working with, which is the Tuesdays, the two Tuesdays a month. Well, without the without the summer break. Is my point right? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, as far as going forward, the, the, the reason this is tight is because we um, because Jeff is in, in short supply. I mean, I don't know how long this COVID is going to continue. I mean, that's a consideration too. I'm, we're, by the are we going to be back in public meetings by July? I would say, and if you don't mind me jumping in here, I would say, go ahead. Let me turn my camera back on. At the very least, come July, you'll be, it'll be possible for hybrid where you can. Those that want to be in a room or vaccinate, vaccinated or feel comfortable can be in the room. Limited um, public can be in the room, but you'll probably still have somewhat of a technical or remote component for people to yeah. be able to call in, listen in, or whatever. So I would hope by the end of May, a lot of that is resolved, particularly since we've got town meeting that we're supposed to have come 1st of June. Um, so I would hope by the time we roll around to June, July, we can get back together, hopefully earlier, depending upon the vaccine rollout and how comfortable people feel getting back in a room. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just go, um, why don't we go with the Tuesday schedule 
as it, as it is, um, and with the Thursday, with and when we get to the to the second of February, we'll make a decision on the uh, on the next meeting whether we're going to have one on Thursday the 18th or no meeting, and do it that way. And then we get to April 6th, we do the same thing. Do we move it to well, April 22nd so or no meeting? What? Well, so the February, I mean, we have to, we put out our meeting dates and filing deadlines because there's the legal lab, there's the funding notifications, they have filing mm -hmm. deadlines with us. So if we're going to have, people are asking what our meeting schedule will be. Um, I think we would need to know if we're having a second meeting in February now because people will be starting to um, prepare filings potentially for that meeting and submitting them. So if we, you know, decide on February 2nd to cancel the 18th, one, you might not be able to because people have already filed for that, or two, we might have someone the next day file if that's still within our deadline. I don't know if it's offhand if it is or not, but it might not be. So I think we'd have to decide... I mean, I guess it, it maybe, you know, maybe by the end of May, we might know what's happening with the meetings. You know, maybe we, we set the schedule to through May at this point, and that gives us a, a bit of time to work with with those unknowns on how meetings might change in the future. Um, but having having our meeting dates and everything available for people helps in advance, helps them with their planning purposes, especially as they might be getting ready to submit something in the next month or so. Um, so the more dates I think that we can provide them right now, it's, it's more helpful for them and us. Well, then I, I, yeah, I can go back and say, all right, forget, forget this February 16th, forget April 20th, and forget September 7th. Give them all those other dates. Right, yeah, day. you don't have to. It's, you don't have to reschedule and then if like that. If it, it's, if you just gave them all those dates and say those are the dates, I mean we, we we're vacillating on this. Meanwhile, everybody else is booking it up. We're not going to be able to get any tickets to, to the uh, exactly grand that. dance. Mm -hmm. So take Tuesday, take Tuesday for um, for uh, you know the twice a month, and um, where where we where we can't have it on the 16th, April 20th, and September. And July and, and September, um, don't don't put it down. Okay, that works. Yeah, that works. Anybody else got any help? What? No, I like that plan. I agree. We got to lock something in. Yeah. And we'll lock that in. We're going to end up in the same situation that we've ended up in before. You know that as, know, we'll be in coronavirus, the as the coronavirus starts to fade out, there are going to be lots more projects that are going to come rolling in. And as these projects come rolling in, we're going to need to have a meeting every other week. I and we will make it. Better go until the beginning of May and see just where everything stands. And fine. at that point, we can make the changes. We can make it any at any meeting. We can make the changes. Right. Well, yeah. Within reason, because we have to get that within. Right. Yeah. But if we don't walk something in. Saturday, exactly. Mr. Right. Chairman, right. Those Saturdays are wide open for you. <laughs> you know how it goes. Yes, you'll be there, right? <laughs> I would Saturday. like to tender my resignation. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you didn't read the you didn't read the fine print, Eric. It's another ten years for you. Yeah. Uh, it, it's on Saturdays. I don't know. Um, yeah. Me so does anybody disagree with? Go ahead, Beth. Oh no, I, I, I was just going to say, well, we can set that up, and then just one other thing is that we're going to start tracking, um, you know, because of the idea of the two to or meeting every three week schedule. We're going to start tracking, like, okay, this, you know, four projects didn't have DEP file numbers in time for every two meetings, or. Things that come up, or and you know, would they, when did it come in? Would they have had it in time? Just so we can later on look at that and maybe mm -hmm. revisit looking at every two to every three week schedule and see if every three weeks is better for those purposes. Not just a DEP file number, but also we need to get 
request for proposals and she just doesn't give much time to get that well, back. Well, if, you, if, you if you bring us anything that has three weeks with it, Becky, you're going to have to bring us a calendar that we can we can come to. So, I'm oh, yeah. And, and this thing, look at it for the future, you know? So, so I mean, like Tuesday, July 4th, I mean, July 6th, um, I don't want a meeting anyway. What the July is right there. Uh, so, we weren't saying you had to. We just said these are possible we scheduled dates if right. you wanted to. I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. All right. But we'll take care of that. That does bring up what, what What would stop us from not scheduling a public hearing for something until a DEP file is issued? I mean, I, I know we do it as, as a courtesy, but it, it, that is something that does create some gridlock for us. And if, if the anticipation, uh, and if we do look at our meeting flows with these continuances clogging things up, why don't we just make it a requirement before, you, before we'll give you a meeting date that we need a DEP file number? Is that unreasonable yeah, or not? First of all, because of the 21-day requirement for being able to have a public hearing. Second of all, there is nothing wrong with going through the entire process without the uh, ID number, and if we agree with the project, we pass the project, we tell the person they don't even have to come back. When we get the DEP file number, we'll take a vote on it, and we'll pass it. Okay. I, I would also add, in my experience, we very, very often get the DEP file number the day of the hearing. So it's... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay. I was just All asking right. the question. So, in summary, we Becky, you have uh, that schedule, the Tuesday schedule, um, without without the um, the conflicts is our schedule. Sounds good to me. Becky, you noticed right. that nobody from the Trails Committee commented relative to the dates that you put down for their meetings, and I think it was absolutely correct. But thank you for at least giving them a fair fair amount of advertising uh, well they are, yeah they already have their dates on there so that we saw those dates on the schedule so yeah. Becky what's next all right what do we got so moving on did you want to do administrative updates any committee updates sure um, CTA is meeting next Monday the 11th, if there's not a, um, if the selectmen aren't meeting that day, so. Otherwise, we'll all be out to lunch. Go ahead, anybody else? I don't, there's, there's nothing else to report. David? Uh, the Trails Committee is meeting a week from now. They had their last meeting in December, but as a result of, of weather, et cetera, and Tom's operation, um, things slowed down quite a bit. Okay. Um, so that's it, Becky. There's your committee updates. Lovely. All right, new business. Um, I had down here CPA funds for uh, fiscal year, should say 2022. Um, I had this, um, and I received an email from the chair of CPC asking if there was any um, request that conservation could be putting forward for the annual town meeting for the next fiscal year. Um, if we were to have something, it would need to be added to the January or February meeting agenda in order to be considered on that. At this time, I, I mean, I don't have anything planned, um, working on to, well, prepared to present for them. I mean, there's a lot of ideas I have for the properties, uh, but I wanted to bring it to your attention and see if there's anything the commission has for ideas um, whether regardless of for the annual town meeting, but also that, I mean, I think that's important. You know, we start thinking about the conservation properties um, some more and maybe some, some good projects kind of moving forward on there. I mean, as you know, we've had some with the interpretive, interpretive signs down at um, Lead Mine. We recently had a Boy Scout project, and these are kind of separate things, but um, who did an invasive species project on Lead Mine with an interpretive sign. Um, 
you know, I'm still working on the outbuilding project, um, project, and I was going to give you my agent update on that, but I guess as they're talking about it now, um, that's um, been put out for requests for bids, um, and that's going to be a pretty involved project, um, overseeing that kind of just, and hopefully when it gets started. Uh, last year, we also asked for funds. Uh, we had that delineation uh, bounce marking done out on the long property, but I think it's good, you know, we've had a lot of permitting this past year, and that's kind of the primary focus, but I mean, we do have our conservation properties and um, there's probably some good management opportunities out there and also um, educational projects that we could think about and maybe get some funding for kind of moving forward. You know, something else to think about that's not just permitting, that's kind of, you know, for the community and for the property, fun projects to think about. So I just wanted to kind of put the thought in your head as, you know, thinking about those type of, type of things. Um, that we can look at doing in the future. Okay. Go, go from there. I, you know, we'll all think about yeah, it. I guess that's yeah. what you're telling us to do. Yeah. It, yeah. And maybe, you know, something that we can kind of add to the, agenda a time slot for these things that we can talk about is is the conservation land you know what's going on at the time any ideas for projects things like that you know nothing wrong but just kind of bring that back into focus so all right um dave uh had requested to have a discussion on signs so i did add that on here um, I did provide you with um, the Mass General Law that applies to fines. So you can read that. And I previously gave you an electronic copy of DEP's enforcement manual. I know you've all read that twice since I've given it up. It's not to you. No. Yeah. Um, but, right, Dave wanted to um, have this fine discussion. So, Dave, I don't know if you want to take the lead here and I can add in. Well, I still believe, even after reading the information from the state regulations, that we should change the wording, similar to the wording that I had suggested in the first place, which was, as a reminder, that fines will be issued daily for 13 days. At that time, they have not been paid. They to be um, submitted, uh, and fines will continue to accrue, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't see anything that, that really changed that view. Well, I guess my comment on that is if you set that precedent, so say you issue a fine and then you resolve it or the person does what they're supposed to do before the 13 days is up. Um, I think that could be difficult, but I feel like setting a standard for fines, you know, every project, every situation is different, right? You know, we had some challenging ones this year that were old permits that, you know, were, were complicated, but typically, you know, these things might come in. I guess, you know, I guess my recommendation is, right, every, every situation is different, but I think everything should kind of start out the same way which first is we issue a letter of non-compliance, you're in violation, which we typically do. Um, and in that letter, it indicates that, that a violation, additional enforcement actions, um, including signing may result by not following whatever we outline in that letter. Stop work, erosion control, come to a meeting, uh, civil site visit, whatever, whatever we're looking for. Um, and in that letter, you know, the letter is the written warning because that is the first part of the fine structure, right? The four part, you know, first is a written warning, second is $25 fine, then it's 50, and then it goes to 100. Um, and that, and that, with that, finding would begin, provided they don't comply, uh, finding would begin from the date of the observation of, of, the, of the violation. So if I go out there and I see the violation on, you know, Tuesday, and then we send them a letter 
um, and they don't adhere to that letter, um, and we give them a date to come to a meeting or whatever it is that we're looking for at that time, then 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 they've already been told they're going to be starting to be fined from the date of the observation. Um, I don't know. Like I said, I think every situation is different, um, but I think it, it would be hard to set a standard for those. Um, you know, and, and right, once you start fining, you know, I think the discussion is right. If they come into compliance, how, how do you want to, to handle that and stop that? You know, the, the project we had earlier this year went in for a long time because we asked to rescind the fines. It, you know, it got really complicated, um, which hopefully typically won't be what happens every time. So That sounds an awful lot more complicated than all of the cases that we've had before. It's typically... What happens is the letter goes out, and the people either agree or disagree. If they disagree, then we go back and look at it, and if they're still in violation, we do an enforcement order. And at the time of yeah. the issuance of the enforcement order, they are fully warned that they're in violation of the Wealth and Protection Act and that fining will begin. And we give them the 10 days or whatever it is in the enforcement order for them to get their act straightened out. And in fact, they haven't got their act straightened out, then the fines ought to be done. And I was just indicating, um, based upon comments that Jeff had made earlier, that one of the things we had to do was to clean up the part about sending out the tickets so that on the ninth day or 13th day or whichever it was, um, we can send them to the registrar and say, look, this person has not paid your fines and they have not fixed the enforcement order, therefore... We want some adjudicatory process to begin. Yeah. So for the the fine, um, we're required to issue them the fine within 15 days of said violation. Um, so the way we have done it in the past is we when we issued the first actual fine after the written warning letter went out. We didn't tell them what to expect with the, the fines coming in the future. So we did send out that first one with a letter that notified them of additional fining will continue. Um, and then we kind of lumped and sent them out afterwards at that point. So we kind of got that first one out as, yep, we're starting. Here you go. Um, this is the letter, what to expect with it. And then in the enforcement order is separate from finding, um, you know, they might be done at the same time, but it is kind of a separate process. And the enforcement order, I mean, really is, I mean, I think the most effective tool to, to use when there is that non-compliance and the, and the violation. Um, and with the enforcement order, um, I mean, issuing that enforcement order, I mean, it's always good for small violations to resolve them without going to that level. But when you have to issue an enforcement order, um, then that starts the clock, um, and they have the 60 days for appeal. If not, then then it goes to town council and it gets brought to superior court. Um, and I think that's an effective tool too. So. Yeah, I, I think uh, a meaningful exercise would be to think of some of the issues. Uh, because there's a wide variety of types of, of things that we deal with. One is where somebody uh, impacts a wetland, and uh, we catch them, and we say, uh, we're going to issue you an enforcement order, and uh, that's going to be to repair that. And uh, you need to bring us a plan, and you got X number of days to get the plan. Uh, in the past, the discussions have been, okay, if we give them uh, 10 days to bring us a plan and they don't, then I think we've said, well, we'll start fining uh, to uh, encourage uh, the presentation of plan. But, and, and the idea of a, of a fine or a penalty, I think we've tried this, and I, and I called a whole lot of uh, conservation commissioners, and I said, well, what do you do if some? What do you do if somebody just runs a bulldozer into the wetland and screws it up, technically speaking? And uh, yeah, you know, they might fix it, but what the heck? You know, uh, 
shouldn't they get a penalty? And everybody said, you know, that is a road that is very difficult to go down. Uh, the penalties are minuscule uh, that we can uh, that we can give. So, you know, I think we're I think we're back to the idea that we uh, find people to get them to move off the dime. Is that correct, uh, Dave? You know, you had a lot of thoughts on that. Is that what we're talking about here? It, it is to move them off the dime, but it is also to effectively work with them when they don't move off the dime. And we don't have the authority to be able to get them to move. Therefore, we have to go through the court system in order to get them to move. This is the process by which we can do it. If we don't well, need the hundred dollars a day, the hundred dollars a day uh, after the three days uh, could encourage them to get off the dime. Then, then the question becomes: Okay, now they got off the dime. They spent fifty gazillion bucks, and our fine was twelve thousand dollars or one thousand two hundred, whatever. You know, and then they say, "Geez, I spent all this money, and look what a beautiful job I did." Yeah. I, I never did pay those fines, by the way, and I'd like to not pay them. And we say, yeah, okay. It's so, I, I, I don't know that that was... Like, we got... Yeah, we got said this. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Now, I was just going to say, you know, the reality is that, uh, you know, I feel like we went through the right process with uh, the, the most recent one, and we were slapped down by the court. So I guess my question at this point is the cost of effort on our agent and the town staff right. and, and also the cost of the ticket because there's a filing cost or a, a, a mail cost that's associated with that, and if we, you know, if we put a hard line in the sand to start these things, it's it's going to increase the instances of them. And how much time and effort is that going to distract our agent from other efforts that might be more important? Um, and that 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 pains me to say that because you know at the end of the day, I think the people need to uh, do the right thing, and we should be able to get them to come to heal. But it it sounds as if we have our hands tied by the Massachusetts state law and uh, the, and the uh, the judges when it gets brought in front of them they say well they've done it we'll just waive the fines and that you know I, I guess well, that's the, yeah. at the end of the day but there's no penalty phase here um, and uh, I guess that's what I was looking for all, all all along the deterrence factor and I don't know that we necessarily have that so well i think one thing that we've never done and that is indicated that we we would need to do is to go to the courts when they have not resolved the issue so in other words everything we've said is 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 right except if 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 they're like done for example not to use is a specific but it was a long time coming and at some point in time, when he had not resolved the issue, if we had taken those fines to court, um, I think the result might have been different. But I think we should try and find out the next time we have a case where somebody's not doing what we want them to do. And that's why the wording was very specific. The wording says fines will be issued only daily for 13 days because that's less than two weeks. It's less than the requirement for the clerk's office to be able to take some action. And at the same time, it's $800 worth of fines. So you can go to them and say, look, they're still in violation. And that, by the way, uh, Eric, you may remember, that was the reason that it was thrown out of court in the first place. It was not a date of the violation. It was not even close to the date of the violation. The violations had started in 2015 and continued into 2020. And the clerk magistrate simply said, well, wait a minute. When, when the violation occurs, that's when we want to hear from y'all. And so that's what we're trying to do by changing the wording in our um, manual. I, I, I would agree with, with doing that. Um, but I really think that we as a board have to, um, to be resolute in executing 
these problems when they come along and, and by doing that, um, figure out how to handle them. Cause we let them, we let them slide. And then, um, I'm surprised that, you know, in the last one that we, we stood firm and then we went and lost it. But, um, you know, in other cases we've, we've, we've slid and we've slid and we've slid. But it has worked. The system has worked. It worked um, out of lead mine um, when they filled the wetland there. It was a finding process that got them to do what they were supposed to do. And as Halterman will remember, that was a big mess. Yeah, you're right. It was a big mess. So this is the I, I just like to say um, I agree that I, I agree. I'm fine with adding this language, but I think the most important thing is is what Ed said. We need to act on this. We need to, you know, go to the court and and get the fines enforced earlier in the process instead of waiting till everything gets resolved and then, of course, we're going to lose the the fine argument. We'll never get those recovered. But if we if we right. act on it then we can actually get the fines enforced. We can, you know, get the reimbursement for our, all the extra work that we have to do to, to do that. All right. So um, we have three in <coughs> agreements. Steve Alderman, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. Just Jeff still there? Oh, go ahead, Steve, and then I have a question for Jeff. So somebody fills in the wetland, we are not going to say, you know, that's worth uh, X number of dollars uh, penalty. We're going to say, okay, now you got to fix it. And that's where the penalties and fines, not penalty, but the fines and all that that we've talked about, that's really the, let's call it the philosophy here. Uh, as much as I really don't like going down that road from, as my past experience, uh, that appears to be what our role is here, and and not to say you know that that's worth ten thousand bucks to because uh, you did that much damage to a wetland. Our role then becomes we're, you're going to fix it, and we're going to get a, a fine, uh, an enforcement order. Uh, there might be a, a fine uh, associated with uh, not getting the uh, responding. To the enforcement order with a plan and so on. I, I think that's where we're headed, right? And we're fine tuning the approach, that approach. With this I don't think it's, I don't think you're at fine tuning yet. Okay, we're, we're going with a hatchet right now. Uh, right. The, uh, yeah. If, if yeah, Eric, you had a question for, for Jeff. Go ahead. Municipality. Universally, are regard courts courts are not going to take a line where okay you damage something there's no there's no punishment right this is about compliance at the local level state agencies federal agencies they have the ability to punish even in the event of compliance um, municipalities it's all about compliance. So once a person has complied, the courts are really going to be, it's going to be difficult for the courts to uphold a fine once someone has, has complied. Now, given to what the chairman said a, a few minutes ago, and I think that's, there is a difference. If you begin finding somebody and said, this is your drop dead date for compliance or, or whatever action you're putting on that date, and they refuse to adhere to that, then going to court, you have that's a different story in front of a judge. You've you've made you've provided notice, you've given them what they need to do, you've levied a fine, an effort to push them into the direction of compliance, but they have refused to comply. Judge, we'd like to have this fine levied. That's a different story. So I think the more you can regiment a process and be very specific and clear with the applicant or whoever is the subject of the enforcement action on time frames and expectations and you know and if 
right? You got to define the if. I think you have a better chance of being successful. Not that I want any resident or property owner to sound fine for whatever reason. It's all about compliance. But there has to be more methodical process, and then you get there. Yeah, I think I think you guys agree with where we, where we, where we ended up. Right, right. So the question I had, Jeff, was yeah, yeah, from a cost from a cost benefit analysis, I hate to make it about the dollars and cents, but you know, we we bring we bring in the town's attorney, and we have to to go and and litigate this for whatever purpose. Um, what's the cost to the town typically? It would depend on the nature of the case. I think Becky is pretty good with conversing with the attorney when we get to the point of enforcement so there's a familiarity with the basic non-compliant issue. Um, so the actual enforcement action is a follow-on. So they're not having to ramp up and learn this stuff prior to going to court. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's going to be an expense. You're never going to make you know. People always say, "Oh, just find people, you make money." You never make money on fines. And the and the cost and the cost to a relationship with a property owner is also at stake there. So I mean, I understand, uh, and it's a last resort. And you've all you've always this group has always looked at it as a last resort, but it's never going to make any money. It's always a losing proposition on many fronts. So I would, I guess, uh, all of that said, I would, I would feel most comfortable if uh, we had a uh, before we make any uh, voting action on this whatsoever. And I'm just one member, but uh, to have, as Jeff said, a clearly defined process laid out by Becky to us, reviewed by Adam or Jeff. And then brought to us that we that that we feel like, you know, it's it's not just well. Uh, this seems like it would be the right thing. This is more. We've had uh, uh, Becky's called some other agents. Adams reviewed it. Jeff's reviewed it. And then we think that we have an ironclad process that we can then start to use on a going forward basis. Um, not that you mean. Uh, you mean Alex? Alex, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Alex, not Adam. Sorry. Okay. But, you know, have Alex re review it and then bring it in front of us so that we can vote on it because Jeff is saying we need to adhere to a process, we need to be deliberate, we need to be thorough, and, right. you know, uh, not that not that David hasn't put a tremendous amount of thought in that, but I, it has, I don't know that Alex uh, has, has even looked at that or reviewed that, and, and is that sufficient for what our needs are? So that's, okay. that's my question. Yeah. And all of this is very well spelled out in the state statutes um, for any type of enforcement action, whether it be blight or whether it be wetlands violations or all these other things, partic you know, specifically because municipalities can't be trusted. And that's just the way the state looks at towns all over the country, not just in Massachusetts. It's a very paternalistic look at your local government partner uh, from the state level. <laughs> Thank you, Mother. Well, I believe you. the subcommittee with Becky in order to get the wording to Alex or whomever okay. else it needs to go to. Right. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, let's leave it there then. Anybody? Any problem with that? Good. Becky, what's next? Uh, just two remaining things. One correspondence. Uh, provided you with a copy of a monitoring report. This is for DEP file number 300-1007, One Hair Road. This was the uh, former Blue Wave, now Amoresto Solar Project. Um, I added this on here just for you to be able to look at. Um, I mean, there's no action required at this time. Um, just wanted to let you know that they are at the end of the project. We've received all their monitoring. Um, and they are getting ready to submit a request for a certificate of compliance for this project. Um, so I did see the about that. And, but, huh? Did you look at the date? In theory, they sent this, this piece of paper out in March of last year. 
Yeah, this is December 4th. Can I give you the wrong one? I didn't see. We we'll have to double check that, but. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. No, I, I think you're right. Content. Yeah, I did. I gave you the wrong one. So the one I have in front of me, this is it. that's one of them. It is December 4th. Sorry about that. I just uploaded the wrong one from the file. Um, this is December 4th, 2020. So this was a more recent report. Um, but. Right, like I said, there's no action needs on this. They're going to submit a request for a certificate of compliance. I did ask them, I said, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that way to the spring for leaf out because there was a lot of restoration planting required out there just to make sure that um, everything is alive out there. That was, that was going to be my question to you is, is how, does that, how does that line of restoration they put in look? Right. Well, they're saying it looks good, good based off the report here, uh, but I think I'd like to see it out there. And there were certain um, specific numbers of plantings that were required, mm -hmm. too. So I'd like them to look at are all those okay. plants there, you know, give more information, too. So we'll wait for the spring on that. But all right, great. I don't normally things like this on the agenda for you. Um, do you want to see all of this correspondence when it comes in? I don't want not be giving you things but there's a lot of stuff that comes in and just trying to kind of filter through you know do you want every monitoring report or do you want me just to look at them or you know there's, there's something that seems more of a concern to add it on or not well if there are action uh, monitoring points if there's an action that needs to be taken or if we need to put them on a site visit or if um if you're updating us on on how the site looks then I'd want to see it, you know. This one okay. is one. This is an important one. This they, uh, yeah. They, uh, you know. I'd be I'd be surprised if if um, if I would be satisfied with what they did. To be honest, okay. um, so I'd like to take a walk out there in the spring. Yep. Okay. And Becky, I have a question about this. Um, I thought that there was a pipe for the electrical that was going through the village. Um, it, are they doing any, um, I don't know, it, it, that was crossing a stream. You know what I'm talking about? Yep, I do. No pipe on this one. You, you're they, talking about the village. They, they, ran, they ran an electrical pipe underground and it was, it had to do a stream crossing in the village, um, right there. I'm trying to remember so, where in the village. This is a different but, solar. We're talking about Blu-ray. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead though with your question. No, I just wanted to, to know, um, how that got resolved and if we're monitoring anything associated with that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought that was this project. Yeah. We're not. It's a good question, though, Becky. How's that? How's that working out with the village? Uh, I'm not familiar with that project. I think that was permitting prior to my being here. I know that there's um, one of the order of conditions over there did get closed out for the solar field right when I right. started, and I can look it up and pull it out, but I believe, yeah, I think when I first started, they had submitted a request and that project was closed out. I mean, I don't remember the details, but I can pull that out. Well, it was also outside of the 200 foot buffer zone for the most part. No, I think you know, he's talking about this pipe to build the yeah, right. yeah, I'm talking about the electrical service that comes out yeah. of Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, I no, mean, it was a very good time to it. Under the bridge, I mean, Trog, right by yeah. the uh, by the shoe shop, right. right. Exactly. We're not into the parking lot. All right, uh, Becky. What else? Anything? Uh, no. This agent report. I mean, just a couple things. Um, you know, we're looking at kind of we're looking at some things here in the office and doing things for this year. Um, one of the things that I'll be bringing to you soon is we need to have a discussion about our local fees. Um, if you remember, 
the town's doing that codification project and all the regulations and the bylaws are all going to be put together. And one of the recommendations was to take the fee amount out of the regulation so we didn't have to go through a reg change every time you want to change fees. Um, so I would like to, and I will be working on coming to you with um, looking at our current fee schedule um, and what we're requiring for those uh, moving forward. Um, we will have to, at some point, um, not soon, but before the annual town meeting, um, we will be getting that qualification project review back to we look at. We will have to hold a public hearing in order to approve those kind of those are more like administrative changes, I guess, if that's the feed coming out. Um, but I aim to have, to, you know, something to look at the feed and have a discussion at that point in time. Uh, okay. I also, this year, want to look at the administrative approval process that we set up um, and look at some other type of minor projects um, and present some options and think about um, what type of small other projects that potentially could go through an administrative approval process. So I'd like to work, I'll be working on that and, you know, we can take a look at some options in the future. Uh, one other thing, you know, thinking about compliance and concerns and especially when these are older permits that kind of, you know, started four agents ago that come in and they become, you know, enforcement issues. Um, thinking about projects that have restoration, wetland restoration, um, things like that, you know, we do have within the bylaw and the regulations the ability to ask for a bond for projects. Um, that may be a good way to ensure that, you know, a project does get wrapped up and finished and constructed correctly in the time frame, which could avoid these kind of enforcement issues we're seeing down the road. Um, so something that, you know, we can talk about this year and, and how that could be a way of assisting with keeping the project on track and compliance issues too. Uh, just, okay. Yeah, just a couple of small things. Um, just to let you know, um, those revisions over at Pilot that were for that um, fire hydrant line, those were completed. I did receive a report on that. Um, the new projects that we recently permitted over at Cedar Lake, uh, there's a new house, the house addition, the garage, those have recently started within the past month or so. Uh, 53 Karen Road, that was the fuel spill on Cedar Lake. I have been talking to um, the representative that filed the notice of intent for that. Uh, that was one we looked at in July that you put on hold for a year because they're still doing some monitoring. We were recently conversing about that. Um, they're still doing the monitoring. Um, their next reporting will be in May. And um, they're hoping that they're going to meet the right PEP thresholds, that there wouldn't be any further work required. So uh, we continued it to July. Um, so for that next meeting, we should have a better understanding if any will be required and what that's needed and, and work towards issuing that permit, uh, whether it's just an after-the-fact type of permit or if it ends up being, you know, after-the-fact, including um, additional work they need to do. So that's, that's about it. There's one right. item that needs to be put back on the agenda, though, in my opinion, that is under old business. Somehow enforcement yep. orders got dropped off again. We can't lose sight of enforcement orders. We discovered this year some enforcement orders that were 10 years old. You need to be able to clean that file out. Okay. We'll fix them. All right. Good. How often should we be reviewing them, David? What would your suggestion be? Quarterly? I think that the, um, the agent should give us an indication as to which ones need to be attacked. So she can prioritize them for us, I think, Eric. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll just make a comment. Good outcomes there. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's why I want to put it up on because I find it in our this year. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Eva, do I have a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Mr. Chair, I make Eva. a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Eric Aspar, second. Here you go, Eric. All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Bye. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Happy New Year. Thanks, Claude. Take care. Thanks, Becky. Take care. You're welcome.